خانم ها آقایان خوش آمدید به مرکز مطالعات ایران شناسی من تو بگم خبر نمید ایران شناسی داکتر سمون و جوردن اگرم برای تو سوال هست که چرا آقای جوردن آقای جوردنی هست که پیابون جوردن در ایران می رسید هست باعث افتخار امروز که آقای دکتر احمد کرمی حکاش با ما هستند و دو نطق مهم درباره تاریخ شعر فارسی از رودکی تا فرود و فرود و فرود و قبل اینکه من از خانم دوتر رحیمی رو خانم ایشون رو معرفی کنم فقط من میدونم دو کلاس آقای دکتر حسین اونی استاد موسیقی دانشگاه ما که تنها کرسی موسیقی ایرانی رو در جهان دارن دانشگاه اینجا هستن خارج از ایران کرسی بده اونجا کرسی شم نیستن کرسیه دانشوهایشون دانشوهایشون لطفاً موقعی که از سالن خارج میشن و در سخنرانی اسمشون رو بنویسن که بدونن که حضور داشتن And now I will switch into English because we have some English speakers Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Samuel I'm sorry uh, welcome to the Dr. Samuel M. Jordan Center for Persian Studies. It is a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Ahmed Karimi Hakak with us, which uh, Dr. Nashin Rahimi will be introducing uh, him. I just want to remind the students in the Persian music class, in the two classes of uh, Professor Umumi, to sign uh, the sheet outside when they leave, so we know that you are here, or and the professor knows uh, that you're here. We have a number of uh, very important guests. I would also like to thank Dr. Khal Khali. Where is Dr. Khal Khali? Right oh, Dr. Khal Khali for his support of the center, especially recently. Thank you very much, Dr. Khal Khali, for your generous gift. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce or ask the uh, Howard Baskerville Professor of Humanities, uh, Professor of Comparative Literature, at uh, UC Irvine, the first director of the center, uh, who got me hired, um, Dr. Nasrin Rahimiye, uh, to come here and introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's uh, indeed an honor for me to introduce my colleague, um, Ahmad Karim, Dr. Ahmad Karim Hathcock, who doesn't really need introductions. I, I put skip the whole thing because he's so well known and he has written so much. We, uh, he has such a presence in the public intellectual sphere. It's a delight to welcome him. But for those of you who may not be familiar with his work, let me um, just uh, summarize the highlights of his career. First of all, I'm just delighted to welcome a comparatist because he's uh, trained as a professor of comparative literature, which is my own specialization, but as we, we know him from his work in Persian literature. So Professor Ken Mahat Park was a professor of Persian language and literature for some almost 20 years, I believe, um, at the University of Washington in the Department of Iranian Culture and Civilization. And um, what's interesting about um, his work is that he started his career in Iran. He studied both in Iran and the United States, and he received his PhD in 1979 from Rutgers University. Um, when I was at Rutgers for one year, I met his mentor, who still talked about yes. him. Yeah. Um, so, and he has, uh, through his, throughout his career, um, he has taught English and comparative literature and translation studies, as well as classical and modern Persian literature at the University of Tehran, Rutgers, as I just <coughs> mentioned, Columbia University and the University of Texas, um, and UCLA, I believe. I so he is, this is where I am going to condense things because he has so much um, to his credit in terms of publications. He has authored some 19 books and 100 major scholarly articles. His monograph, which I recommend to all 
of you and we use as a primer in Persian, in the study of Persian poetry, is recasting Persian poetry scenarios of poetic modernity in Iran. That was published initially, I believe, in 1999. It's been re, uh, reprint, a reprint has come out. And he has contributed articles on Iran, Persian literature, um, and he's a regular contributor to reference works like the Encyclopedia of Translation Studies, Encyclopedia Britannica, and uh, of course, not to forget, um, our own Encyclopedia um, Ironica. His works have been translated to many, many languages, and of course, we cannot list all the awards and honors that he has received. Um, what I also share with um, Dr. Hackpock from our past career together is he served as, I think, one of the first, were you? The, um, president of the Society for Iranian Studies. So, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Ahmad Kalmiyat. Thank you, Nancy John. I can't tell you what a genuine pleasure and honor it is to be standing here uh, before the esteemed audience uh, that's gathered here. But the other night, we enjoyed a wonderful stupendous performance by Dr. Mumuni, uh, a great friend of mine, whom I had the pleasure of uh, bringing to the University of Washington in the 1990s. And uh, following him, uh, there came Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan, the famous Badwal. Famous and uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have a course we didn't have a chair of uh, Persian music, but we did have a rotating chair. And, uh, during the 19 years I was there, uh, three people, Nusrat uh, Fadi yourself, and Darius Tabari, came and uh, taught our students the, at least the, the uh, preliminaries in Persian music. But your performance the other night was just amazing. It, it was really exciting. Uh, Nassim John, thank you so very much. Uh, as you say, we've been friends forever. Uh, and so uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you for directing the center. I recall uh, this center 2005 when I had just been invited to the University of Maryland and at that time uh, there was a gathering of all of us to uh, deliberate on how this center would be conceptualized. And uh, of course the name of uh, Samuel M. Jordan was, uh, is an amazing name. There's even Persian poetry on him. You know that, of course. Uh, he really made an impact in Iran. And I think a similar impact is being made here in the form of educating students. And those of us who have something to do with education, we know what a laborious work is, but we also know what a rewarding career it can be. It's an amazing uh, reward when your students become professors here and there, and you know, and uh, recall you and, and all of that. It's it's, it's a, a profession that has its own reward. And of course, Turaj, where are you? Thank you, Turaj, for directing this center so beautifully after Nasreen and uh, maybe so many, uh, so many events, uh, organizing so many events, I, I, I genuinely want to be present every one of them, but today when I made an effort, it took me an hour to get from home to uh, the University of Irvine and another hour to get lost in it, and until I had to call uh, Saeed, and thank you Saeed for helping me and for everything else that you do at this center. Um, this beautiful poster, it's, it's, it's really very appealing. It, 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 it's the, the best poster I've seen. Thank you, Kurush, for making this here. Uh, uh, Kurush Beitpur, I think, made this, right? Uh, it, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful poster. And of course, my uh, friend, Dr. Ali Reza Akbari, himself a professor of economics and business at uh, Cal Lutheran University, I have no no talent in making posters. He made this poster, so uh, uh, the credit goes all to him. The blame goes all to me, of course. Uh, 
so much for the thank yous. I, I know there are so many people that I need to thank you that I, we don't have time. So forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you're all here. And I hope we'll have a good uh, dialogue together. It, I welcome these events because I am the beneficiary of the question and answer at the end when you know my ideas are weighed by yourselves and, and, and I receive wonderful feedback and I always have. Uh, <coughs> the history of Persian poetry from the beginning to today uh, dividing two from Rudaki and of course I go before Rudaki as well to Farouk uh, Farouk and from, uh, to, I'm sorry, to, to Hafez and part two in the afternoon from Hafez to Farukhzad. So we have got about 500 years of history uh, from Rudaki to Hafez or from the beginnings of Persian poetry uh, to Hafez and 600 years from, well, over 600 years from Hafez and on. You can, you can even stretch it to Jami. He dies in 1492. So 1492 is not just when Columbus saved the ocean blue. It was also the day, the, the year when, when uh, the Muslims and Jews and were driven out of Al-Andalus, and when, uh, when, when uh, ten years after that, nine years after that, the Safavids uh, came to power in Iran. Of course, there was a, a, an initial uh, contraction of the field of Persian Mushar, which we'll be uh, talking about today. So. Uh, the poems that I'm going to highlight are the most, are, they are not the best poems, but they are the most illustrative, the most, uh, m most instruments of, 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 of uh, analysis for my analysis. So they serve that purpose. They may not be uh, poems, all Hafez or all Saadi or all those people who, whom we respect so much uh, by our taste today, but those who may have may be representative of the turning points in the history. Let me also tell you about a little bit about the three main concepts here. History. Of course, you know, it's a huge thing. Everything is history, because everything <coughs> is in the past, right? Uh, but so anyone who writes history will have to have his own historiography explained in a way and justified. And so my historiography is based on the notion of everlasting change. Change is the only constant unchanging things in, 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 in anything, even in, in the appearance of human beings. We all become more beautiful when we all grow old, old, right? Uh, so uh, it's, uh, in a way, this would be Darwinism if it did not have this, the, the social struggle or the uh, survival of the fittest in it. But it is a process of growing complexity. Uh, it's an amazing tradition, 1100 years of poetry, and it begins with simple, simple expressions, simple similes and metaphors, uh, very easy to understand. Mir ma has to bukhara, asman ma tui asman ayadham. Very simple, that's Rudeki, right? But even before Rudeki, uh, and I'm wondering how I can move to the next one, say, John, what do I do to move to the next one? Ah, this one. Thank you very much. So moving on, uh, Persian, the language. Uh, it's a language that's amazingly capacious in terms of poetry. It may not have performed over the centuries very well, as well as Arabic, for example, in, the, in, in telling the story of sciences. Uh, we are still trying to catch up with modern sciences in Persian. But one thing is for sure, Persian is not to be equated, ladies and gentlemen, with Iran. We'll see at the beginning of the second part that Persian has its own realm. In fact, at one point, 14th, 15th centuries, the, the Persian language had a realm far vaster, vaster than China today, the country of China today, or the China, Chinese uh, language. So it's, it's an international or at least transnational language, uh, people of various creeds and ethnicities have contributed to it. With uh, I have come across, and this is an amazing thing, in, in Dakar, uh, I have come across 200 years of the Bahmani rule there, before the Delhi Sultanate, I've been talking about all of this, during which time, 200 years, there are 12 poets who have divans in Persian, in the Persian language, 
but who are either Hindus or Buddhists. Isn't that amazing? How we kind of line this up with Islam. Of course it's lining up with Islam because Islam is, is the majority re uh, religion of the people for forever. And, you know, and, and so Persian uh, is, articulates Islamic ambitions and, 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 and decrees and so on and so forth. But it does not mean that it has not come to contact with other, coming to contact with other, other peoples and other ethnicities and so on and so forth. And finally, poetry. I refrain from judging. Talking to my people yesterday, someone called me from Portland asking, uh, what's my opinion about this? To him, a certain poem was poem, uh, poetry, a certain other poem was not, was, not a, was not poetry. And I said, well, doesn't that point to your subjectivity? We all have our own favorite po poems. But poetry in the largest sense is anything that claims to be poetry. So we kind of di should uh, divest ourselves from our personal views. It's good, personal taste is always there. But we should not be using that as a criterion that transcends us. When we say, I like this poem, I don't like this poem, sometimes, oftentimes I've heard Iranian, especially Persian speakers say, this is not even a poem. Well, what is it? <laughs> if, the, if, if, the, if the composer, the writer said this is a poem, uh, what? What other criteria do we have to call it something other than poem? Yeah, sure, there are good poems and not so good poems. The poems that last, Mon de God, they, they, they kind of uh, withstand the test of time, and then there are poems who don't. I can, I can, cite, I can cite to you uh, a million lines of the Persian Ghazal who are as good as dead, because we don't read them. And I can cite to you, yes, of course, Ferdowsi and Khayyam and Nizami and Tafiz and Saadi and maybe a few more. Uh, the favorites of today. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is today. We don't know if it will be the case tomorrow. The tomorrow of history, of course. So, mind you, uh, not to generalize on the basis of today's taste. I always cite this example. Today, who rules over all of Persian poetry? Hafiz, of course, right? A hundred years ago, it was not Hafiz. It was Saadi. And 150 years ago, Hafiz was last written on the margins of Salman Sabahji's divan. So he was marginalized, literally marginalized, by other poets. But it's like the stock market. Stocks rise, stocks fall. <laughs> So do not generalize from the taste of today or this generation to the entire canon or, or, or corpus of Persian poetry. So uh, having said all of that, let me move to some, something that's really uh, definitely something that we are here to speak of, and that is uh, one footnote before I move into the substance of the thing. I, in my own head, I have turned all of my dates into the common era because I don't want to be confused by the Hijri Qamari and Hijri Shamsi and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, it's all the common era dates. And this, is not, this did not get started with me. Uh, the late Hassan Tarizadeh proposed this 110 years ago, just at the time of the, the, the Constitutional Revolution. Unfortunately, it didn't take. And now we speak different languages and we use different calendars. So if all of my, my years are according to the Gregorian calendar. In other words, the Miladi. So the story that Persian poetry has to tell us is the story of growing sophistication, increasing complexity, layer upon layer of similes turning into metaphors, metaphors turning into symbols, symbols turning into allegories, <coughs> conceits, and so on and so forth. And, and I know these are, these are kind of uh, you know, terms of trade for us, but suffice it to, to, to say that Hafez cannot be read the same way as, as Rudeki is, because Rudeki is fairly simple, he's fairly early, and so he, his, his language is less complicated, less encumbered, Language itself gets encumbered. That is, it, it attains all this, all this, uh, uh, this load through time. So let me move to the first illustration that I have here. And that is, of, I, I spoke about part one and part two, and this is part one, of course. And how do I move to the next one? Oh, here. OK. 
What's this? آهوی کوهی در دست چگونه دوزا اونا دار از یاد یاد چگونه بابزا Mountain deer in the plain How would he run? He has no mate How would one be without a mate? It's, that's a question to contemplate I want you to imagine something Imagine a beautiful meadow somewhere in Sogd of Samarkand Central Asia somewhere and someone is looking at mountain deer in the play. Have you contemplated my mountain deers as, as a kind of deer? They have sponge-like hooves because they jump from crag to crag. They go up and they go down and their hooves will have to cling to the rocks. That mountain deer has now been seen spotted on the plain. Imagine a law, a level law, law. How do you imagine this mountain, mountain deer in the play? Do you imagine him falling down or falling down? Do you imagine these knees bent and bending ever more? Or do you imagine him doing fine? Well, I have news for you. You are the mountain deer. You're, uh, you're displaced. You've been displaced. We all have. So how are you doing? You are that mountain deer. And in a way, that's the simple poem is based on observation and contemplation. Observation, meditation. You see something, you think something. And that's the story of much of early Persian poetry. That's why I've given it the name worldly. This is a worldly tradition. This tradition begins, let's say, in the late 9th, early 10th centuries and goes all the way to the beginning of the 12th centuries when it begins to, ga to, to gain another layer, to adopt to another, another set of ideas. So, but let's, I have quite a few uh, poems as examples of that first phase of the word literature. I saw a hoopoe outside Sarachs, a little song rising up to the clouds. I saw a colorful garment on her, so many varied colors on it. Filthy world, topsy turvy. I'm totally confounded in you. The observer, whoever he is, understands beauty, but does not understand why so much beauty can be found in such in such topsy turvy world in such an ugly word. Parabune means not beautiful, ugly. Parabune bajbune jahan. So observation, seeing a little bird, that beautiful, and then contemplating the environment in which this little bird is placed. That's Sudeki. Uh, Notice another observation. This is an interesting one. The same poet, Rudeki. Someone is going to the mosque, and the word mihrab is there to testify to that. But he is in love, and he's conflicted. So when the poet says, what you is heading for the arched altar to pray? Heart filled with thoughts of Bukhar and beauties, Bhutan et Haraz. Our God accepts temptations of love from you, will not accept your prayer. Rui be mehrab nahadan chesud del be Bukhara o Bhutan et Haraz. Izad ma? Bas vase ya ashiqi as tu pazirat? Na pazirat namaz. Is this a case of being ambivalent? seeing spotting some ambivalence in that person moving towards the mosque? Or is this a case of absolute hypocrisy? And how about Izad the Ma? Is that, is that different from his Izad? Our God. Now, you will not be able to move beyond these, this dichotomy, just like the Kuhandash, the mountain and the plain, just like 
the mosque and, and Bukhara in two different directions, unless you begin to think of Khorasan in the 10th, 11th centuries. And I don't mean Khorasan that's today in Iran. I mean the greater Khorasan uh, that includes well, almost all of Afghanistan and much of uh, Central Asia, almost to the west of China, Khotan, right? That place, ladies and gentlemen, was a site of confrontation between Islam in the 10th, 11th century and Buddhism. Nova Bihara, Nova Bihara, or later was transformed into Nova Bihar, was the largest Buddhist temple north of Hindu Kush. So, what does that tell us about Rudaki, the port? But doesn't it tell us that this man may have a different izad than the person who is walking towards the mosque? If it does, why do they tell us, all these biographers, that he at the age of five could, could recite all of the Quran? That's in the Tazkirat. Or maybe eight. Or some people even try to be less unrealistic. They say, okay, sometime in his life, he knew the Quran by heart. And Nova Bihari, Nova Bihar, the Buddhist temple, was raised to the ground a hundred years after Rudaki. So think of those little environments, those, those places where poems are written. Rudaki was from Samarkand. He's right there, and he's, he's seeing this. And he has lived through it. In fact, when, uh, when Sultan al-Ulama, uh, Rumi's father, walked with him towards the city of Bach, they can still, they could still see the demolished temples of Buddhist temples. To this day, in eastern Iran, there are about 200 caverns, caves. Of course, there's law of Islam. There's no, no, uh, uh, no, uh, no. What, what's law uh, No, uh, getting away from social life in Islam, but in Buddhism, there was <coughs> her hermeticism. Uh, so, the alternative of the past, the past is a foreign land. Just because today, almost 98% of Iranians are Shias, regardless of whether they practice or not, or not, it doesn't mean that Iran has always been like that. And Persian poetry is there to testify to that, if we can only read it well. We can only drag the meaning out of it. In one of my talks, and it, it's become a reference to, uh, people keep, keep giving me reference, I said, every, every poetic text is like half an orange. You have to press it and get the last drop of juice out of it. And yet, there, have, there, have, there are so many histories of Persian literature that for one thing, they, ta they talk about the literature of Iran. Iran is good, fine, thank you, but you know, not all Persian happened in Iran, to, in today's Iran. <coughs> and secondly, it happened from a super nationalistic perspective that wants to, wants to actually give everything to Iran, give credit to Iran, serve Iran rather than go after the truth of things. Confiscate everything in the name of Iran. So poor Afghanistan. It's not as resourceful as Iran has been. Uh, and so it keeps, it keeps trying to, to make it. The geography of the Shah Nameh is all, all Afghan geography. In fact, Samangan is right there. And Zabul is right there in Afghanistan. But we have done, we have done, we have confiscated all of the Shah Nameh in the name of Iran so badly that when Afghans were, and they, you know, then they didn't have enough presses to publish Shahnamas of their own, they would take Ferdosi Shahar Bozogi Iran, they would wipe out the word Iran, and they would say, Mom. <laughs> we have entered this silly, ridiculous war among ourselves because we love our countries as if to say something poured out of this realm, and the language is such that we all share it, and the Tehrani dialect is only one dialect, and there is no such thing as a standard language, 
it seems like you're you're speaking uh, you're speaking cold. You're speaking you know uh, uh, against something sacred. Those things are the things that we need to try to rise above. So uh, back to this poem. How about your God? Would he accept the temptations of love, or would he accept your namaz, your prayer? It, the poem forces us to choose one or, or the other perspective because it's there and because it's simple for everyone to understand. Now, a famous poem, and remember, almost all of the poems that I'm using, I'm using excerpts because if I wanted to give you full poems, uh, we would not have time to get through the, the two lectures t today. Uh, again, worldly, shodzi was yashashvacha, live joyfully. Because the world just does not make sense. It just does not make sense. And so there's the example of me and my beloved. It's true that beloved may be Hur Nejar, but it's an earthly Hur. So again, a worldly observation. And a rec it begins with an invitation, an exhortation, a command to us to live joyfully. Hudaki did not have all day complex anxieties that someone like Sadi or Hafez has. He did not sweat life. He lived it. Or at least the poem tells us. So once we read it right, we begin to glean from it glimpses of a social context, glimpses of religion, glimpses of, the, of all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, contexts. This is from Manucheri, Manucheri of Dongbon, another uh, 10th, early 11th century poet. And he talks about wine as the antidote to sleep. So he's asking for wine to be served. He's, of course, at a court festivity, right? He's there. He's been invited by the king or some, some uh, noble man. And uh, he enjoys his wine. So Rudaki even talks about how to make wine. So we have all kinds of wine worship. Uh, wine worship ceremonies uh, reflected in Persian poetry. Uh, now we get to something that I keep coming back to because this is Persian poetry at the Indian frontier. Masood Saad Salman lived in Lahore and Lahore was his hometown. So we, we began with Samarkand and Bukhara. We now have come to Herat and Ghazni and now we are going down to that's how the Persian language moves. And it then goes to, into India. Now, this man is from Lahore. And like you and me, he's estranged from his hometown. And besides, and this is unlike you and me, he's imprisoned. So he's lamenting. It's a poetry of lament. It's a poem about lament. And he likens himself to the child of Lahore who has been separated from the mother. And the child is like the body, and the, the, the town is like the soul. Can you think of Shiraz or Esfahan as your soul if you're from those cities? Uh, it's that kind of a relationship. Besides, he's got two shackles around his feet. And he's asking his hometown, who has become a disembodied soul, disembodied spirit. <laughs> Again, all kinds of poems, whether it's celebrating, or mourning, or lamenting, or whatever it is, it is worldly. It has to do with concrete, palpable life, as we know it. All of that begins to change with Sanai. The trouble with historicizing Sanai is that Rumi did him no favor when he said, Ataru Bud Sanai do Chashnu. Because we do not, we do not have a, 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 a continuous tradition of literary criticism at that time, because Rumi said it, so we all, have, we all believe it, and we all have to believe it. Well, nonsense. 
Rumi is a very good poet, but he's no literary critic. He's no Nasrin Rahimiye or me or, or, or these people who have studied the science of poetry and not, are, are not necessarily poets themselves. Oftentimes, people fail to distinguish between the two. People who go to school and become scholars of Persian poetry, for example, and those who have the talent and they write beautiful poetry but cannot teach it. So, anyway, during that whole tradition that I went through with you, we have the Shah Namitu. I've not spoken of it because that's, you'll have to invite me again to speak about the Shah Namitu. So, uh, but the, 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 the tradition of the Shahnameh makes the development of Persian poetry have two fountainheads. The Quran is one, the Quran and all the literature that stems from it, and Ahadith and so on and so forth, including Nahj al uh, and of course the Shahnameh. So you've got the pre Islamic tradition and the Islamic living tradition of Islam. But this Islam is also changing. Because by, the t by this time, by the time of Sanai, early 12th century, uh, what happens is mystical writings, the commentators of the Quran, have appeared. Ali Hujviri in, in, in Lahore uh, writes his, uh, his Kashf al Mahjoub. Khaja Abdullah, around the same time in Herat, writes his Tabakat al Sufi. And ultimately, 100 years later, Attar writes his famous Tazkirat al-Awliya. What is the difference between the mystics and the orthodox Muslims? The mystics add a layer to the relationship that previous poets have, 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 have painted between the lover and the beloved, the poet and the king. In the panegyric tradition, you have a poet and a king. And a king. The poet gives the king eternal name. Hopefully it's a good name. The king gives the poet financial security in the form of sale and so on and so forth. It's an exchange. It's an exchange of commodities. A poet's commodity is his poetry. A king's commodity is all the plunder that they have made or whatever it is that's in their, in their, in their treasury. In that sense, the poet feels obligated to elevate his patron into something of a Feridun-like figure, the, a paragon of virtue, a paragon of justice, and so on and so forth. The guy may be, may be a, a, a terrible king, but you can't, you can't say that. You can only say, you know, uh, you can only justify it by saying, if I say this, he may try to become better in the future. And of course, there's that love, love relationship. Now, one very important point is that the lover and the beloved positions have been misunderstood for the entire duration of modernity and modern literary criticism in Iran. As you well know, Persian does not have gender in its pronouns, so we do not have he, she, and it. We have only what? And as such, when I talk about him or her, who, they, I'm not, I'm not assigning a gender to them. It's for us translators to cope with that when we translate Persian poetry into English. Uh, but then, that leaves us free to have a lover position that's not sex-bound and a beloved position that's not sex-bound. So we don't need to go through this lengthy discussion that has started with Dr. Yarchater and has gone to Sirus Shamiso and others on whether the beloved of Persian poetry is male or female. It can be either. By appearance, it's a female, but it doesn't matter. Much Persian poetry is bisexual. Uh, so again, we have, we have a two sets of relationships. One, two sets of relationships. One is the lover and the beloved. The other is the poet and the patron. With the coming of the Gnostic trend in Persian poetry, one other layer is added to it. And that is the relationship between man and God. And that's what separates the Gnostic mystics and the Orthodox. To the Orthodox, after we die, we go under the air and have to wait for uh, Israfil's uh, trumpet to sound, right? Maybe may 5,000, 10,000, no one knows when. 
The mystics believe you die, you get elevated. Os, in fact, becomes the word for Rumi. Just like Jesus. You get elevated, you rise up. It's called Mi'raj. And of course, the, para the paragon of Mi'raj is the Prophet Muhammad, who actually was summoned by God and, 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 and gave, the angel Gabriel came and uh, put him on his uh, horse and, and, and they went, and no time passed. And that, of course, that story has been told in, in, in the introductory section of so many Persian works of literature. So, with that, something happens that I have called interiorization in Persian poetry. And that is all the assets, or most of the assets of Persian poetry go from out there to in here. That's the kind of transformation process that Simorg goes through. Compare the Simorg of Shahnameh with the Simorg of Mantabotir, and you'll see. The Simorg of the Shahnameh is corporeal. She lands, and she makes noise, and she, she raises dust, and she talks to Zal, and, 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 and uh, the, uh, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of, uh, and, and uh, uh, give, give some advice on how, uh, Rudabe is supposed to give birth to Rostam because the, 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 the baby, the fetus, is too big for the human body. So it's a, it's a real animal. It's a real bird. It's a big bird, the, the size of 30, let's say. In Atar, you do not have that symbol. What you have is a presence. It's a mirror reflecting yourself. In this case, those 30 birds that actually achieve audience with it. Number two, who are enemies of Rostam? Hmm? Maybe Akwandi, maybe Divisepi, maybe dragons, thieves, demons, and dragons. Cut, a hundred years later, who is the enemy of Sheikh San'an? Again in Mantabotir, his nafs. That's who, that's who he has to fight his lower, lower instincts, his animal instincts. Because human beings retain the capacity of becoming animals, remaining human, or even ascending, improving themselves to angelic positions. So that's, that's what I call interiorization. And one of the, the, the assets of Persian poetry that get, uh, that get uh, very, very much uh, coverage is Jama Jam. This Jama Jam is of course related to Jamshid. Or in the Shah it's K Khosro. It doesn't make a difference. But it's a real job. It's a real crystal ball. You look into it and you see the way of the world. The world. In this case, what is the what does it become? It becomes Dereto, Dele Arif. So again, it loses its objective presence and it becomes something that's associated with uh, with uh, uh, Salik. Salik Majzu or Majzu is Salik, depending on whether you're still on the way to Suluk or on the way back from Suluk. That is the difference between, in poetry, between the worldly and the unworldly. And as we go on in history, other things happen. I spoke about the commentators of the Quran. And we are seeing now this interiorization here. But the next step is the centrality of love. Love, love, love. The skies possess no altar but love. The earth is beautiful by naught but love. Enslave yourself to love. Therein lies the idea and occupation for those with a heart. The world is love. The rest is only guide. All is a game, save the game of love. Jahan ishqastu digar zarq sazi, hame bazi is illa ishq bazi. Can you imagine that? Isn't that beautiful? Practice that the next time you do ishq bazi. You see how good it feels. Or better yet, make your ishq bazi be ishq sazi. I love this, this uh, English idiom, making love. If you take make in the sense of constructing, building, just like, just like a, a work of art, just like a, a dwelling, right? 
So to, to, say, to say that the skies possess no altar but love is a daring thing. Imagine. Nezami has a story about this. He puts this in the introduction to Khosrow al Padis. He has already done his Mahzan al Asrat, his famous uh, book of mysticism. When, when the rumor goes to Ganji that he's writing uh, the story of those gaps, pre Islamic people, one of his friends comes and says, You have a Mahzan, you have Mahzan al Asrat. Why are you dealing with those gaps, those Zoroastrians before Islam? That's sinful. And Zami says, sit down, let me read a couple of lines to you. And he reads this passage, which is much uh, more than this. And it ends up with saying, uh, So the whole creation stands in love. Uh, that's the third thing. So the commentators, the interiorization, and now the centrality of love. And this centrality has, has wings. It really takes over Persian poetry in no time. And almost nobody, none of the mystics, none of the following poets, write poetry in neglect of this. Everybody is indebted to Nizami for this huge centrality. So another layer gets added to the poetry, gets more and more complex. I have to uh, go about two centuries, you know, uh, jump two centuries and go to Hafiz, because we want to pause on Hafiz a little bit. Uh, in Hafiz, what happens, I have given it a name. I've, I've called it emotive distillation, or taktira atifi. Emotive distillation, what does that mean? That means to Hafiz, of course, Siobash died. And of course, an injustice was, uh, was done to him. Ferdowsi has told us the story. But for, 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 for Hafiz, the whole story boils down to the question of shame. Shame on Afrasiyah. Shame on Garcidas for having done what they did. The story has been told and it's known. We don't even know if Sadi or Hafiz may have read the Shah now as we know it. Khalid bin Mutlaq didn't live there. But uh, the point is, the stories are well known. And Hafiz, as a lyric poet, wants to say, you know, here's the story. The gist of it, the juice of it, is Shah. So, Shah Turkan, in this poem, is Afrasiyab and is not Afrasiyab. Shah al Turkan, you see it? The king, king of the Turks, his beloved, is and is not Afrasiyab, or is both. And so, Mudayan is his rivals, the Rabi, the Mudayan, right? And he is asking that, that beloved to feel shame. You have done an injustice to me. I love you and you don't love me back. Notice how the whole of a story is pressed into one emotion. That's what I call emotive distill distillation. Uh, or another one. Ma qasriye sekandar o dara nakhandim az ma be juz hikayat mehru wafa makurs. We have not read the narrative of Alexander and Darius. Ask us about not but the tale of love and loyalty. In saying this, he, 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 makes it, he leads us to, to knowing that he has read it. Because he knows that the story of Alexander and Darius is the story of, of revenge and hate. So why is he pretending? He says, where he has read it, or he knows about it. Because that's not the point. The point is, I am a disciple of love and, 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 and faith, faithful. So that's the he, in, in so many ways, Hafiz is dear to us today because he really crams all of that heritage into single lines. Another example of that is this one. In that famous 
مزرعه سبز فلک دیدم و داسه مهنو at one point he says rely not on that dark thievish star of the night who robbed Kabus's throne and Kekoso's girdle but if you ascend to the sky naked and pure as did Jesus as did Christ then your glow will cast a hundred rays upon the sun تکیه بر اختر شبگرد مکن که این ایار تاج کابوس رو بود و کمر کیخست رو گر روی پاک و مجرد چون مسیح ها به فلک از فروغ تو به خوشی به سر سر فرق Those of you who have read the Shah Nama know that کیخست رو is a great king and کیخست رو is a horrible king Foolish, stupid But it doesn't matter, they're both human beings Therefore the passage of time illustrated here in the, in the movement of the, of, of, of the uh, the, the days and nights and so on and so forth, it raises them to the ground. It brings them to annihilation. The person who survives is Masiha, because he is not human. He's blessed by being the son of God. There's, this, there's a hadith about this. They say as Jesus was rising through the, the, the firmament, in the fourth firmament, which is the firmament of the sun, his movement became slow, and God was impatient to see his son. So he sent a message to him. He said, you have a rope, and on that rope there's a, there's a needle, and that needle is a symbol of earthly belonging. Take the needle off, drop it, become naked, and come to me, which is exactly what Jesus does. That's when he becomes Paco Mujara. That's when he becomes pure and, and completely naked and he gains admission to the presence of God that's why at the end of the same Ghazal Hafiz is Hafiz in Khirghi Pashmine he is uh, he's exhorting the Hafiz of in the, in the poem to act as Jesus did not as Keiko Soi Kekos my final illustration in the first part of this talk is this very, very crowded ghazal, which I'm going to read whole. First in English and then in Persian, with your permission. On the day of Azal, rays of your beauty broke forth. Love emerged and set the world afire. Your aspect shone forth. Angels, unable to love, saw it, and moved by the fire of jealousy, fell upon Adam. Reason, meanwhile, set out to enlighten itself using the flame, but the fire of zeal turned into bolt lightning, stirred up the world. The pretender moved to enter the sight of secrets. The invisible hand struck his chest, for he was the outsider. All others cast their lot in pleasures pure, but my heart cast hers in far more sorrow. Hafiz composed the joyful, the joyful book of your love, on the day when he abandoned all pretense of a happy heart. در ازل پرتو به حسنت تجلی دم زد عشق پیدا شد و آتش به همه آلم زد جلوهی کرد رو خد دیب ملک عشق نداشت عین آتش شد از این غیرت رو بر آدم زد عقل میخواست که از آن شعله چرا غفرو زد برق غیرت بدرخشید و جهان بر هم زد مدعی خواست که آید به تماشاگه راز دست غیب آمد و بر سینه اینا محرم زد دیگران قرعه قسمت همه بر عیش زدن دل غم دیده ما بود که هم بر غم زد جان اولوا حوس چاه زنخدان تو داشت دست دست در حلقه آن زرف خمن در خم زد حافظان روز طرف نامه یش به تو نوشت که قلم بر سر اسباب دل خرم زد It's a very crowded poem come to think of it and it's based on the story of the day of Alast. You, you all know that day, of course. The day of Alast. The, 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 the beginning of, of human life. When God has created this mass of clay that includes Adam and Eve and every one of us, all the way through the end of history. He still has not breathed his own soul into that mass of clay, which means it has, not, it has no soul as yet. So he asks the question, Alastu barabbukum? Am I not your God? Alu bala. And Sarai says, as barai yek bala, can dar azal gufta as jan, ta abad mard bala, and dar bala uftada as. 
and Barrow is Betty, of course. Uh, so, think about this. On that day, Hafiz is not just say, seeing a, a, a mountain deer in the plain. He's not just seeing a, a, a wine tasting, wine, wine drinking ceremony. He is talking apocalyptic. The beginnings and ends. This is the story of creation. And it begins with an emanation, with a tajalli, and the appearance of love. And that love then begins to confront all kinds of things. Angels, of course, cannot love. So if someone tells you you're an angel, they're not doing you a favor. <laughs> uh, love is, and animals can't love either. They have sexual instinct, but no love, as we know. And so it's Adam only in the chain of being that can enjoy love. And then, no, notice the personages of this poem. First of all, there's Hosnat, to. There's the addressing, which is God in this case. Uh, or uh, Rokhat. And then there's Ahl. Then there's Mudai. And then there's, uh, there's uh, Namahram. And then there's Digaran. And there's me, and all kinds of things. It's a very crowded poem. And if you think of it, and if you sit down and write 40 pages about this one poem, as I have, you'll see how crowded it really is. And it shows in the end the angst, the deep angst and anxiety that someone like Hafez feels. My God, Digaran did that and, and, and my heart is doing this. It's a tremendously forceful poem. And it shows you all the complications, all the complex layers that Persian poetry has attained in the 500 years that separate the mountain deer from him. And the story will go on. The story will go on in a way that you'll see it, it's really a payazan. It's really a pouring out of Persian poetry so that Persian becomes a koine word, a koin, K-O-I-N-E. That means a language of the arts, a standard <coughs> language of artistic expression when other language, functional languages, the other functional languages exist in its place. Story of a language that establishes contact among people who have no, no shared language. Unfortunately, of course, after some centuries, it also begins to, 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 to retreat because it never becomes, especially in India, it never becomes the language of the masses. It remains the language of the elite. But Persian poetry is an elitist, is an elitist discourse, no, no, no doubt about it. Uh, people live their lives never knowing that there's such a thing as Persian poetry. And yet you're all here. So it's, it's, it's the kind of art that gains in complexity generation upon generation. And I've only touched on four or five important voices, but there's so much more to talk about. And so uh, I'll let you go have your lunch and come back and we'll talk some more. Thank you very much.